the weird of Avusel Wuthokwan by Clark Ashton Smith Narrated by Matthew Schmitz 1. Give, give, O magnanimous and liberal lord of the poor, cried the beggar. Avusel Wuthokwan, the richest and most avaricious moneylender in all Camorium, and by that token, in the whole of Hyperborea, was startled from his train of reverie by the sharp, eerie, cicada-like voice. He eyed the supplicant with assiduous disfavor. His meditations as he walked homeward that evening had been splendidly replete with the shining of costly metals, with coins and ingots and goldwork and argentry, and the flaming or sparkling of many tinted gems in rills, rivers, and cascades, all flowing toward the coffers of Avusel Wutokwan. Now the vision had flown, and this untimely and obstreperous voice was imploring him for alms. I have nothing for you. His tones were like the grating of a shut clasp. Only two pazurs, O oh generous one, and I will prophesy. Avusel with the Quan gave the beggar a second glance. He had never seen so disreputable a specimen of this medicant class in all his wayfarings through Camorium. The man was preposterously old and his mummy-brown skin, wherever visible, was webbed with wrinkles that were like the heavy weaving of some giant jungle spider. His rags were no less than fabulous, and the beard that hung down and mingled with them was hoary as the moss of a primeval juniper. I do not require your prophecies. One pazur, then. No. The eyes of the beggar became evil and malignant in their hollow sockets, like the heads of two poisonous little pit vipers in their holes. Then, O Avusel Wuthokwan, he hissed, I will prophesy gracias. Hearken to your weird, the godless and exceeding love which you bear to all material things, and your lust, therefore, shall lead you on a strange quest and bring you to a doom whereof the stars and the sun would alike be ignorant. The hidden opulence of earth shall allure you and ensnare you, and earth itself shall devour you at the last. Be gone, said Avusel Wutukwan. The weird is more than a trifle cryptic in its earlier clauses, and the final clause is somewhat platitudinous. I do not need a beggar to tell me the common fate of mortality. 2. It was many moons later, in that year which became known to pre-glacial historians as the Year of the Black Tiger, Avusel Wutukwan sat in a lower chamber of his house, which was also his place of business. The room was obliquely shafted by the brief, aerial gold of the reddening sunset, which fell through a crystal window, lighting a serpentine line of irised sparks in the jewel-studded lamp that hung from copper chains, and touching to fiery life the torturous threads of silver and similar in the dark arises. Avusel Wutukwan, seated in an umber shadow beyond the Isle of Light, peered with an austere and ironic mien at his client, whose swarthy face and somber mantle were gilded by the passing glory. The man was a stranger, possibly a traveling merchant from outland realms, the usurer thought, or else an outlander of more dubious occupation. His narrow, slanting, barrel-green eye, his bluish, unkempt beard, and the uncouth cut of his sad raiment were sufficient proof of his alienage and camorium. Three hundred dijals is a large sum, said the moneylender thoughtfully. Moreover, I do not know you. What security have you to offer? The visitor produced from the bosom of his garment a small bag of tiger skin, tied at the mouth with sinew, and opening the bag with a deft movement, poured on the table before Avusel Wutukwan two uncut emeralds of immense size and flawless purity. They flamed at the heart with a cold and ice-green fire as they caught the slanting sunset, and a greedy spark was kindled in the eyes of the usurer, but he spoke coolly and indifferently. It may be that I can loan you one hundred and fifty dijals. Emeralds are hard to dispose of, and if you should not return to claim the gems and pay me the money, I might have reason to repent my generosity but I will take the hazard. The loan I ask is a mere tithe of their value, protested the stranger. Give me two hundred and fifty dijals. There are other moneylenders in Camorium, I am told. 
200 Dijals is the most I can offer. It is true that the gems are not without value, but you may have stolen them. How am I to know? It is not my habit to ask indiscreet questions. Take them, said the stranger hastily. He accepted the silver coins which Avusul Wutukwan counted out and offered no further protest. The usurer watched him with a sardonic smile as he departed and drew his own inferences. He felt sure that the jewels had been stolen, but was in no wise perturbed or disquieted by this fact. No matter who they had belonged to or what their history, they would form a welcome and valuable addition to the coffers of Avusul Wutukwan. Even the smaller of the two emeralds would have been absurdly cheap at 300 Dijals, but the usurer felt no apprehension that the stranger would return to claim them at any time. No, the man was plainly a thief and had been glad to rid himself of the evidence of his guilt. As to the rightful owner of the gems, that was hardly a matter to arouse the concern or the curiosity of the moneylender. They were his own property now, by virtue of the sum in silver which had tacitly been regarded by himself and the stranger as a price rather than a mere loan. The sunset faded swiftly from the room, and a brown twilight began to dull the metal broideries of the curtains and the colored eyes of the gems. Avusul Wutukwan lit the fretted lamp, and then, opening a small brazen strongbox, he poured from it a flashing rill of jewels on the table beside the emeralds. There were pale and ice-clear topazes from Mu Tulan and gorgeous crystals of tourmaline from Tishu of Vulpanami. There were chill and furtive sapphires of the north, and arctic carnelians like frozen blood, and diamonds that were hearted with white stars. Red, unblinking rubies glared from the corsicating pile. Chateauians shone like the eyes of tigers. Garnets and alabrondines gave their somber flames to the lamplight amid the restless hues of opals. Also, there were other emeralds, but none so large and flawless as the two that he had acquired that evening. Avusul with Uquan sorted out the gems in gleaming rows and circles, as he had done so many times before, and he set apart all the emeralds with his new acquisitions at one end, like captains leading a file. He was well pleased with his bargain, well satisfied with his overflowing caskets. He regarded the jewels with an avaricious love, a miserly complacence, and one might have thought that his eyes were little beads of jasper set in his leathery face as in the smoky parchment cover of some olden book of doubtful magic. Money and precious gems, these things alone, he thought, were immutable and non-volatile in a world of never-ceasing change and fugacity. His reflections at this point were interrupted by a singular occurrence. Suddenly and without warning, for he had not touched or disturbed them in any manner, the two large emeralds started to roll away from their companions on the smooth level table of black oga wood, and before the startled moneylender could put his hand out to stop them, they had vanished over the opposite edge and had fallen with a muffled rattling on the carpeted floor. Such behavior was highly eccentric and peculiar, not to say unaccountable, but the usurer leapt to his feet with no other thought save to retrieve the jewels. He rounded the table in time to see that they had continued their mysterious rolling and were slipping through the outer door, which the stranger, in departing, had left slightly ajar. This door gave on a courtyard, and the courtyard, in turn, opened on the streets of Comorium. Avusul Wutukwan was deeply alarmed, but was more concerned by the prospect of losing the emeralds than by the eeriness and mystery of their departure. He gave chase with an agility of which few would have believed him capable, and throwing open the door, he saw the fugitive emeralds gliding with an uncanny smoothness and swiftness across the rough, irregular flags of the courtyard. The twilight was deepening to a nocturnal blue, but the jewels seemed to wink derisively with a strange phosphoric luster as he followed them. Clearly visible in the gloom, they passed through the unbarred gate that gave on a principal avenue and disappeared. It began to occur to Avusul Wuthukwan that the jewels were bewitched, but not even in the face of an unknown sorcery was he willing to relinquish anything for which he had paid the munificent sum of 200 Dijals. He gained the open street with a running leap and paused only to make sure of the direction in which his emeralds had gone. The dim avenue was almost entirely deserted, for the worthy citizens of Comorium at that hour were preoccupied with the consumption of their evening meal. The jewels gaining momentum and skimming the ground lightly in their flight were speeding away on the left toward the less reputable suburbs and the wild, luxuriant jungle beyond. Avusul Wuthukwan saw that he must redouble his pursuit if he were to overtake them. 
Panting and wheezing valiantly with the unfamiliar exertion, he renewed the chase, but in spite of all his efforts, the jewels ran always at the same distance before him, with a maddening ease and eerie volition, tinkling musically at whiles on the pavement. The frantic and bewildered usurer was soon out of breath, and being compelled to slacken his speed, he feared to lose sight of the eloping gems. But strangely, thereafter, they ran with a slowness that corresponded to his own, maintaining ever the same interval. The moneylender grew desperate. The flight of the emeralds was leading him into an outlying quarter of Camorium, where thieves and murderers and beggars dwelt. Here he met a few passers, all of dubious character, who stared in stupefaction at the fleeing stones, but made no effort to stop them. Then the foul tenements among which he ran became smaller, with wider spaces between, and soon there were only sparse huts where furtive lights gleamed out in the full-grown darkness beneath the lowering frondage of high palms. Still plainly visible and shining with a mocking phosphorescence, the jewels fled before him on the dark road. It seemed to him, however, that he was gaining upon them a little. His flabby limbs and pursy body were faint with fatigue, and he was grievously winded. But he went on in renewed hope, gasping with eager avarice. A full moon, large and amber-tinted, rose beyond the jungle and began to light his way. Camorium was far behind him now, and there were no more huts on the lonely forest road, nor any other wayfarers. He shivered a little, either with fear or the chill night air, but he did not relax his pursuit. He was closing in on the emeralds very gradually but surely, and he felt that he would recapture them soon. So engrossed was he in the weird chase with his eyes on the ever-rolling gems that he failed to perceive he was no longer following an open highway. Somehow, somewhere, he had taken a narrow path that wound among monstrous trees whose foliage turned the moonlight to a mesh of quicksilver with heavy, fantastic rattlings of ebony. Crouching in grotesque menace like giant Rashiri, they seemed to close in upon him from all sides, but the moneylender was oblivious of their shadowy threats and he did not the sinister strangeness and solitude of the jungle path, nor the dank odors that lingered beneath the trees like unseen pools. Nearer and nearer he came to the fleeting gems, till they ran and flickered tantalizingly a little beyond his reach, and seemed to look back at him like two greenish glowing eyes filled with allurement and mockery. Then, as he was about to fling himself forward in a last and supreme effort to secure them, they vanished abruptly from view, as if they had been swallowed by the forest shadows that lay like sable pythons athwart the moonlit way. Baffled and disconcerted, Avusul Wutukwan paused and peered in bewilderment at the place where they had disappeared. He saw that the path ended in a cavern mouth, yawning blackly and silently before him, and leading to unknown subterranean depths. It was a doubtful and suspicious-looking cavern, fanged with sharp stones and bearded with queer grasses and Avusul Wuthukwan, in his cooler moments, would have hesitated a long while before entering it. But just then, he was capable of no other impulse than the fervor of the chase and the prompting of avarice. The cavern that had swallowed his emeralds in a fashion so nefarious was a steep incline running swiftly down into darkness. It was low and narrow and slippery with noisome oozings, but the moneylender was heartened as he went on by a glimpse of the glowing jewels, which seemed to float beneath him in the black air, as if to illuminate his way. The incline led to a level, winding passage in which Avusul Wutukwan began to overtake his elusive property once more, and hope flared high in his panting bosom. The emeralds were almost within reach. Then, with slightful suddenness, they slipped from his ken beyond an abrupt angle of the passage, and following, he paused in wonder, as if halted by an irresistible hand. He was half-blinded for some moments by the pale, mysterious, bluish light that poured from the roof and walls of the huge cavern into which he had emerged. And he was more than dazzled by the multi-tinted splendor that flamed and glowed and glistened and sparkled at his very feet. He stood on a narrow ledge of stone, and the whole chamber before and beneath him, almost to the level of this ledge, was filled with jewels, even as a granary is filled with grain. It was as if all the rubies, opals, barrels, diamonds, amethysts, emeralds, chrysolites, and sapphires of the world had been gathered together and poured into an immense pit. He thought that he saw his own emeralds lying tranquilly and decorously in a nearer mound of the undulant mass, but there were so many others of like size and flawlessness 
that he could not be sure of them. For a while, he could hardly believe the ineffable vision. Then, with a single cry of ecstasy, he leapt forward from the ledge, sinking almost to his knees in the shifting and tinkling and billowing gems. In great double handfuls, he lifted the flaming and scintillating stones and let them sift between his fingers, slowly and voluptuously, to fall with a light clash on the monstrous heap. Blinking joyously, he watched the royal lights and colors run in spreading or narrow ripples. He saw them burn like steadfast coals and secret stars, or leap out in blazing eyes that seemed to catch fire from each other. In his most audacious dreams, the usurer had never even suspected the existence of such riches. He babbled aloud in a rhapsody of delight as he played with the numberless gems, and he failed to perceive that he was sinking deeper with every movement into the unfathomable pit. The jewels had risen above his knees, were engulfing his pudgy thighs, before his avaricious rapture was touched by any thought of peril. Then, startled by the realization that he was sinking into his newfound wealth as into some treacherous quicksand, he sought to extricate himself and return to the safety of the ledge. He floundered helplessly, for the moving gems gave way beneath him, and he made no progress but went deeper still, till the bright, unstable heap had risen to his waist. Avusul Wutukwan began to feel a frantic terror amid the intolerable irony of his plight. He cried out, and as if in answer, there came a loud, unctuous, evil chuckle from the cavern beneath him. Twisting his fat neck with painful effort so that he could peer over his shoulder, he saw a most peculiar entity that was crouching on a sort of shelf above the pit of jewels. The entity was holy and outrageously unhuman and neither did it resemble any species of animal or any known god or demon of Hyperborea. Its aspect was not such as to lessen the alarm and panic of the moneylender, for it was very large and pale and squat, with a toad-like face and a swollen, squidgy body and numerous cuttlefish limbs or appendages. It lay flat on the shelf, with its chinless head and long slit-like mouth overhanging the pit, and its cold, lidless eyes peering obliquely at Avusul Wutukwan. The usurer was not reassured when it began to speak in a thick and loathsome voice like the molten tallow of corpses dripping from a wizard's kettle. <laughs> what have we here? It said. By the black altar of Satanua, tis a fat moneylender wallowing in my jewels like a lost pig in a quagmire. Help me, cried Avusa Wutukwan. See you not that I am sinking? The entity gave its oleaginous chuckle. Yes, I see your predicament, of course. What are you doing here? I came in search of my emeralds, two fine and flawless stones for which I have just paid the sum of two hundred dijals. Your emeralds? <laughs> said the entity. I fear that I must contradict you. The jewels are mine. They were stolen not long ago from this cavern in which I have been wont to gather and don my subterranean wealth for many ages. The thief was frightened away when he saw me, and I suffered him to go. He had taken only the two emeralds, and I knew that they would return to me, as my jewels always return whenever I choose to call them. The thief was lean and bony, and I did well to let him go, for now in place there is a plump and well-fed usurer. Avusa Wutukwan, in his mounting terror, was barely able to comprehend the words or to grasp their implications. He had sunk slowly but steadily into the yielding pile, and green, yellow, red, and violet gems were blinking gorgeously about his bosom and sifting with a light tinkle beneath his armpits. Help! Help! He wailed. I shall be engulfed! Grinning sardonically and showing the cloven tip of a fat, white tongue, the singular entity slid from the shelf with boneless ease and spreading its flat body on the pool of gems into which it hardly sank it slithered forward to a position from which it could reach the frantic usurer with its octopus-like members. It dragged him free with a single motion of incredible celerity. Then, without pause or preamble or further comment, 
in a leisurely and methodical manner, it began to devour him. <laughs> 